presentation, we've got two co-presenters, uh, co-workers, both good friends. Uh, David Cowan is a, an instructor here with SANS and is also uh, with KPMG, where he's a managing director now. And he has worked with probably hundreds of forensic investigations over the years and uh, really, really brings that knowledge into the material that, that he teaches and that he puts together and the research that he does. Um, and he is also one of the, the authors, the lead author, in fact, on our forthcoming Forensics 509, which is our cloud forensics course. And I know a number of you in the uh, Discord were asking about that. So I wanted to make sure you knew that David is one of the folks behind that. And we also have uh, Matt Sayer, who is also at KPMG, works with David and has for quite some time. Um, and he has also supported just tons and tons of cases. And he's presented with our summits a number of times in the past. Um, also worked with a number of technical papers uh, that have been reviewed and published as well. So that certainly is a, a much different level of, um, of vetting and validation that goes into that. And it's, it's certainly awesome to, uh, to have your perspective and bring the operational knowledge into that, um, you know, research heavy, research centric environment. So. With that all said, um, looking at uh, low-level artifacts, I will let you guys go ahead and kick it off. Uh, thanks for sharing your time and sharing your experience and knowledge with us. We appreciate it. Well, thanks for having us. With that, it's the Forensic Summit. I'm Matthew <laughs> Sayer, I'm and Dave with me, as always, David Cowan. That's right. So, Please note that Matt's name is first in this presentation. <laughs> I'm here to translate. <laughs> um, so I am actually having a little bit of tech difficulty real quick. I thought the slides were going to be up. There they yeah. are. Now I'm seeing them. Um, I, was, I was starting to freak out for a minute. Like I might have not had that pulled up and I was supposed to. But, um, all right, so I got to figure out how to work the slides first. All right, so <laughs> did I do that is the topic of our talk, and it is understanding the action of artifacts in real time, or understanding action and artifacts in real time and the correlation between the two. Of course, none is more famous than Steve Urkel asking the question, did I do that? And this is an important question for a number of reasons. Um, and for us as forensic investigators, and Phil just a second ago was talking about, you know, validation and stuff. This is very important for validation. And obviously, you saw from Lee Whitfield's talk earlier, or hopefully you did, um, you know, validation is so important in this field. And this is something I've been working on for a while. And it's actually, it was obviously inspired by David Cowan because he, a while back, he started something called Fun Day Sundays. And in Fun Day Sundays, you have to figure out why an artifact has a certain behavior. And we don't really know why, but we want you to help us figure it out, right? So, um, yeah, so did I do that? So we want to understand this connection between action and artifact. And it's not always what we think it is. Um, there's so many times we've gone into CTF making that we've gone, we've performed an action, and then we go to create these questions and answers for the CTF. And we're like, we're not seeing what we thought we would see here. And well, that's because maybe what we were doing wasn't leaving behind what we thought it was leaving behind. Um, and there's a lot that goes into that, right? So this, the, the talk is showing you ways on how to, you can create these hypotheses and how you can go about validating the hypothesis, right? Um, so some common methodologies, right? A lot of the times when we have a question and we want to see what happens when we do an action, and what's being left behind in forensic artifacts, there's kind of two ways we can go about this. One is before and after kind of collecting the artifacts, then parsing the artifacts. But then we have to even do differentials on that data, right? To really understand what just changed after we did something. 
Um, and, and it's very tedious work, especially when it's one of those things where it's like, I'm going to change this. All right, do a differential, collect the artifact, parse the artifact, differential, didn't do what I thought it was, and then rinse and repeat, right? But then you also have this concept of live monitoring, right? If we all have used process monitor. Let's see um, what files are being touched, what registry keys are being added, what values are being changed. And that works great um, at a high level, but on the low level, forensic artifacts are very complicated binary structures. And we're not going to see what changes in those binary structures with the live monitoring. So my approach to this is, one, I want to make something that's more efficient than just doing the whole perform an action, collect the files, parse the data, difference that parse data. Now I have some results, but that didn't have what it was, so I rinse and repeat. It's very time consuming. So what if every time that, you know, David Cowan throws out a new Sunday fun day, I could just like load up some stuff and then see how some of these forensic tools or forensic artifacts are changing in real time. That would be awesome. Uh, unfortunately, it's just not that easy either though, because you're still having to create um, parsers for each one of these artifacts because they're always going to be different, right? But so I, I approach this with a very hybrid approach. Combine the two methodologies. We want some near-time results. And one of the benefits of this method is we can use other people's tools and libraries that we're familiar with. Um, we can even use native APIs. We can use libraries that we're accustomed to, like maybe we want to use uh, libtsk, maybe we want to use a Windows API to parse an event log out or something, right? But the point is we need to monitor in real time to have triggers that we can use to call a tool. Like, so if I say, hey, every time this prefetch file gets created, I want to use a tool to parse out that prefetch file and then do the differential, right? So, and there's two things. So one, it can be targeted where we say, hey, every time this specific file gets touched, parse and difference, or we can even do it on time, like every like 25 milliseconds, just parse this artifact and then do the difference. Um, but the point is to make this process a little bit more efficient and like leave the whole collection uh, type deal behind because it, it takes a lot of time. So this is kind of what I was talking about. So like you monitor at a hot, you can use these process monitors, uh, even some of the Windows tools that utilize the Windows API. But again, you don't have that very specific artifact view. It's very high level. Um, and then, but this system can be used to call those triggers so that we can kind of do whatever custom actions we want. So the, one of the first things we want to talk about is USN listening. And this has been very helpful throughout my career. Um, Cowan and I worked a very long time on a great tool that could take the journal, reverse it, show you amazing <laughs> things. And, but one of the best things about this tool was that it would look for events within the USN journal. And that was nice because you could go to a bucket and say, hey, show me all of this Dropbox activity that happened. And it's just looking at the USN journal alone. And what's neat about that is there's so much user action or just action in general that you can get out of the USN journal that's outside of just a file create and a file delete. So ways that we can determine these things is we can use Windows APIs to listen to specific artifacts, or we can use the Windows API to monitor events in real time to help to trigger parsing of specific artifacts. So this slide is a good example of the Windows API, the more technical, right? Like you can take this slide later on when you're like, hey, I remember this presentation where they talked about monitoring the USN journal. How do I do it? Just go to this slide. It's going to take you to the APIs you need to know about 
Um, and in this specific one, we're using the device IO control. You can pass in the query USN journal and it basically brings you back ranges of USN uh, records in a buffer. So this, um, basically it's gonna contain multiple records. You kind of have to go through, parse it out, but it's cool because this is the type of data that you get out of it. Things like um, data overwrites, truncations to the file, creations to the file, deletions to the file, renames, right? And with that, we can both, one, we can use this to see what's happening in the forensic artifact itself because the USN journal is an amazing artifact. And don't forget, it's a sparse file, which means you can carve for it. Not as fun anymore with all the solid state trimming, um, but still useful. So, oh, and another real quick pro tip, uh, USN numbers is actually the offset into the USN journal. It's a sparse file, so it just always grows. Just a little pro tip. Anyways, so here's the potential that you have when you're monitoring the USN journal. So this is a tool that I made that leverages that same API call and it's just listening to it in real time. So you can see what's happening and what shows up in the USN journal as we perform actions on a test machine, right? And this works really well when you're using an external device instead of your system. A system can get um, a, little, a little loud, but you can see that when we erase this file, there's a pattern in the artifact itself. And this can help us home in on when we see this in the USN journal, hey, this was eraser. We know that because we ran the eraser act, uh, the eraser tool, and we saw the same pattern, right? So now we can create these hypotheticals. We can validate, yeah, we know this was most likely uh, eraser based off of our of our research. But not only that, because we know there's a pattern we can now quantify and reverse back the original names of the erased files. And that's huge. Um, so just a little slide throwback. A couple years ago, I did another talk at the SAN Summit and it was using Arongo DB. And in one of the examples, there had been wiped files. And I was actually able to create and show an Arongo DB query that would fetch back the original names of the wiped files. And that was based off of a pattern. Well, it goes back to the question of, okay, well, how do you know that pattern? How do you get to know that pattern? So it, it's all based off of research, right? So when I'm talking about using these Windows APIs, I'm talking about it more from a research point of view than I am from a, hey, here's great ways to, you know, create your own EDR system. Maybe you could use them, um, great, but I know for from the forensic research point of view, this is a really big thing because it enables us to validate our findings. It, it enables us to validate our, you know, hypothesis of, hey, well, it looks like it might be a pattern from this specific tool. Or if I see a tool, I can go back and see, okay, here's what that tool would leave behind because in my testing, this is what we see. I'm going to give Matthew a chance to breathe real quick while I try to translate a lot of what he just said for the last 14 minutes, because some of you may be entirely lost right now. So before, when Matt and I were doing this kind of research and Matt figured out how to hook into all of these APIs and figured out how to be able to get this data and then load the MFT and match up records in real time, and figure things out, we had a very regimented testing process where we had to do something, hope we didn't screw something up, then pull the data, parse it, and wait to see the result. And so what Matt's showing you is not only valid for testing, because obviously in testing you can do it a whole lot faster if you can see the results of your test as you go along or you're trying to understand what's happening. Two, if you're playing with malware and you're trying to see from a sandbox perspective what's happening, you don't have to wait for the sandbox report to be generated and you can interact with the malware as you go along to see what kind of records it's changing. And then three, one of the biggest biases that we get when we do our investigations is that we only see the end result of how things happened. 
we don't get to see the steps that occurred to get there. So if you're trying to have bulletproof defenses in your work, being able to recreate what occurred is essentially important. And so being able to see what pattern of access, what chain of commands leads to the artifact in the state that you find it means that this will be even faster as well. So this is something that we had internally that Matt and I have been playing with for a very long time. And now Matt is opening this up kind of, kind of the, the larger universe. Uh, essentially, you know, we can do that a lot now because we, work, we both work for KPMG now and we don't have a small shop where we have to worry about everything every day. Um, you know, we're, we're able to show you how we were able to get so much faster and be able to create these patterns and understandings. Yeah, so what's also awesome and you didn't know about David Cowan is he's also a Matthew Sayer translator. That's actually <laughs> like could be on his resume, right? <laughs> It's true. So let's talk about MFT listening for a second, because this is a really cool Windows API trick that I found out about um, that's just mind-blowing, because I didn't know you could do this. You can actually call a Windows API and get back a whole MFT record, which is really cool. Now, there's a couple cave caveats, like you can't fetch unallocated records with it, but otherwise you just pass it the reference number, um, and it's going to bring you back the raw MFT entry buffer, which is really cool. So knowing that, we, I could now take this and create another monitor. So this is where we get to the hybrid approach where the MFT itself doesn't actually have any type of callback system. So we need to use another system to create triggers for when we want to call this MFT API and get records back to parse and then diff and then show the user, right? So, it's, yeah, so this combines just these different techniques um, because no specific monitoring API. What does that look like? Something like this. So here we could just, I don't know, change an attribute. Now, it parsed the MFT first before we did anything. And as we change things, it's just diffing all of the attributes and returning to us what changed. It's not, it's leaving out everything else, right? So here's an example of time stomping. Okay, what attributes in the MFT just changed from running that time stomp, right? So this is a great way, even, even if you're coming into the field of digital forensics and you want to know how artifacts work, this is a great way to understand artifacts. And the, the big thing here is that Matt's not only showing you, hey, a file name changed, hey, a timestamp changed, because there's lots of tools that'll do that. Matt's actually bringing out the underlying MFT attributes, showing you the attribute name and showing you the parse data as it changed so you can understand within the full MFT structure what is actually occurring. And that's something that the other tools just don't give you. And it will make, if you're trying to do low level testing, and that's the whole point of this is understanding really what's going on beneath the cover so you can fully explain and understand the actions that you're seeing, uh, it's essential. So now let's talk about some event log listening. Event log is nice because now we actually start getting into AB, APIs that have actual callback systems. Everything else we're kind of calling on a loop and looking for changes, um, but none of them are actually being called back to by the subsystem. So there's, there's a difference in kind of how these low level APIs work. With the event logs, we just create a function, register it, and now as Windows gets um, events created by certain providers, it just passes those to us, which is nice to develop with, but it's also a much more complicated system. But we use Windows events in so many of our investigations. So why shouldn't we have some type of monitor that just sits there? And Because I want to know what my actions are doing and what events are being created out of it. Now, obviously, that gets really noisy sometimes. So we kind of want to create our test uh, scenarios to how can we filter out the noise stuff and just see, get to where we're, what we're interested in and then find patterns out of that, right? Um, so again, one of the cool things about uh, the event log API is that you can actually use XPath queries and structured XML queries to really drill down 
So the events that you want to return when you're listening to them in real time. So another quick demo of an example, and don't worry, at the end of this presentation, you'll see where you can get all of these tools. Uh, they're actually all done in Rust, with the that exception of fast. Rust. They're very fast, right? So you can see here, we're listening to events, and actually in this case, I'm using grep to kind of get rid of some trash. And I just mounted a VHD, because why not? I just want to see what happens when you mount a VHD. But you get the point here is I say, hey, I'm interested in this action. And then I start up these monitors and now I perform that action and I just see what comes of it. And then from that, you can start looking for patterns. And specifically, what Matt's showing you is that he's actually capturing the event log entries as they're being created and piping it out to this stream. And if those event logs, you know, the way this works, as Matt's going to talk about, you can actually turn them on and off. You can do all sorts of things to kind of amp up and amp down. So a default system, a fully enabled instrumented system, however you want to do it. But rather than having to go back to the event log and reparse it each time, you actually get to see for those the event logs you're subscribing to, for the sources you're subscribing to, exactly what's changing as you're doing things. Right. It's all about trying to eliminate the noise and really get down to the observable events and patterns of every time I perform these actions, I see this specific sequence of events or MFT changes or whatever it is you're looking for. So next we move on to the event tracing. And the Windows event, event tracing for Windows is a, a great system. And you hear, you, you see a lot of presentations on this stuff, especially from like the FireEye people, right? And, but this has such great use for us for doing research and seeing what happens because it gets so detailed about what's happening on the system, which works out great for being triggers of, hey, when do I need to go parse this artifact and then show you the difference of it, right? Because whereas the USN, the MFT, the event, well, event one, yeah, but this is able to show you the processes that invoke the changes that you're going to be seeing, which is very powerful because now if I want to home in on something a little bit more, now I can do it by process IDs. I can create trees and say, hey, only show me um, any type of changes that spawn off of this specific process and any threads that it creates and so on and so forth, right? But it's a very difficult system. Like, it is so complicated. That is an understatement. <laughs> In any case, but, I want to interrupt Matt here to explain something. Oftentimes, when Matt and I are talking to other people in the field, especially from other companies who are actively doing this research, there's three things that they want to talk to us about normally if it doesn't involve tacos or barbecue. Number one, they want to ask us about the journals. Number two, they want to ask me and bug me about the cloud class, which is coming. But three, they always say the same thing. We hear you're working on ETLs. How does that work? Can you tell us more? And we always say the same thing. It's really complicated, and there's more than you think it is. So Matt is about to do everyone a great favor in what he's about to show you. Yeah, so needless to say, and, and there's a huge difference between listening to ETL uh, or ETW live and subscribing to these events versus parsing these off of other machines, right? So if you're doing an investigation and you, you're doing like dead box investigation, right? Or you're reaching out and you're wanting to grab these event trace files, that type of parsing and retrieving events from those files is completely different than um, monitoring for these in real time. In fact, monitoring for these in real time is a hundred times easier. If you're interested in parsing out these ETL files that get created by all sorts of applications, um, go watch Nicole Ibrahim's presentation. She's given them at SANS before and a few others, the Magnet Summit, on how uh, she goes about parsing them and the tools that she's made to do that. Completely different kind of investigation techniques, right? Um, needless to say, it's great for creating triggers of 
when to parse out artifacts. So if I want to say, as before, we used the USN journal. So the MFT monitor was actually using the USN monitor to see when a file changed. When that file changed, it would do the diff on the MFT, right? So we can use the same type of technique here, but utilizing uh, ETW. So now I can say, okay, whenever this process touches this file, go ahead, parse it, give me the differential. Um, so it just, it gives us a whole new triggering mechanism for doing this with, right? So this is, this is the initial thing that led me to go down this road was Cowan had thrown out a Sunday fun day of user assist. And he said, hey, why can you, how do you run applications and the user assist run count does not get updated, right? So what would happen is you try and go execute an ex uh, an executable any way you could think of, right? But then you would have to parse out the registry, parse out the binary in the registry values, do the differentials every time you tried running an executable a different way, right? Way too much work. So I was like, okay, well, how can I monitor registry keys? And then every time a specific registry key changes, grab that value, parse out that value, and then do differentials to see if my action caused the run to cause the executable to run, but not the user assist run count, right? And so this is why that's difficult though. This is the Windows registry. These are the user assist keys and it's a bunch of binary. So it's not like there is no API you're gonna find that's going to parse out these individual values for you, right? Like this is, you're going to have to write a parser and then create a triggering system that parses those data structures in real time. So this was the final result of that. And what we're doing is the user says, this is the only Python script that I'm using in these examples. Everything else is Rust. So I run this and it's just sitting there monitoring the user assist values as they change and parses them out. So I can actually go and type in a command, you know, perform any action I want on how I want to execute this application and then see in real time how the user assist keys are changing. So if the user key runtime in this specific example, it's just the user, um, the application run count and then the registry uh, location. So if I can execute an application and not see that number increment, I know I've found a way to launch this application without increasing the run count. Pretty cool stuff. And so all of this just goes to show you like, um, you know, there's no one great way to do all of this. I was just, I'm looking for more efficient means to do research and do these things in real time as I go, instead of having to collect these artifacts every single time, parse them out, do differentials on output, and then it, being able to more efficient efficiently do research and validation is huge for investigations. Absolutely. And one of the things that Matt's not saying is that his ability to create that monitor for the user assist allowed us to answer some questions that we couldn't figure out for over a year to be able to actually see that interactivity to understand what the triggers and conditions were that let us have blank entries. So now we can actually explain that and we were being asked questions about it. Yeah. So now we're kind of just getting to an overview. Here's a little cheat sheet for you. You can take this back if you're ever wanting to dive deeper into this type of stuff. It is, it's not all very user-friendly things. Um, I apologize, but it is what it is. It's Windows APIs, and I like them over Mac any day. Um, <laughs> but then again, I haven't deep dived into Mac yet, but we'll get into that in a second. So just use this as a reference. Nothing more. Just shows you the different control codes, Windows API names that you can use. Um, so, but what about other OSs, right? Like, what about Mac APIs? What about Linux APIs? So there are some that exist that you can do similar stuff with. So I. I know for sure FS events is an API you can create callbacks to for Mac. Uh, I notify on Linux. I think there might even be I notify for Mac. Um, I haven't 
dive deep into a whole lot of those yet. Not at that point in my journey, <laughs> but hopefully soon, right? So can we be friends? Like, how do you use these type of things? And can you use them without getting too technical? Because the APIs aren't practitioner friendly. But good news, there's already some tools and libraries that can help you out with this stuff. And it's not limited to Windows. So, um, and we all use Python, right? Because we've got libraries in Python that we can use, unless you're Brian Morand, in which case you're still using Perl and keeping it alive and well. Good job. I appreciate that. Both Dave and I appreciate you. <laughs> so uh, for file system events, uh, Watchdog is great. Like even using something that's a high level, Watchdog will still give you those uh, high level events, file opens, uh, file changes, file deletes, and that's actually cross-platform. So you can use that on Mac, um, or I believe it's also on Linux as well. And again, I think it's using things like the FS events, the iNotify. And then PYWinTrace, right? So another FireEye tool. This one helped me out a lot in my early startings uh, on trying to figure out this whole API system. So there are things that you can use and put into your Python scripts or some tools that are already made, including process monitor. But the goal here is to programmatically create a trigger system to parse out these artifacts. So you can't do that with something like process monitor. Um, so with that being said, that's about all of it. Um, you can always hit Cowan and I up on Twitter. If you want the Rust tools that I was demonstrating today and the, the Python ones as well, I have a Forensic Mac GitHub account. You'll find them on either the RS, which is Rust, Windows thingies, or the PY Windows thingies. So with that being said, I think uh, now we can kind of, well, actually, Callan, you have any final statements? Um, we only have 30 minutes. I think we used it all up. Thank you very much for all your attention. I hope you realize that these things are incredibly useful. And if Matt and I were smart, we'd charge a lot of money for them. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> At least for, our, for, for, for the sake of the community. Um, we actually do have a couple minutes for, uh, for a few questions. Um, okay. So there are a few that were in here. And um, you know, this is one that I was, I was hoping you could, you could follow back up on just because um, you know, a lot of people may not be as familiar with the uh, the various artifacts like the OSN journal. Um, can you give just a real brief overview on on you know recognizing the artifacts that it can give us? Like, is this something that is on by default? Do you have to enable this? Is you know what is its its you know the elevator pitch kind of use case to the operating system? Okay, so the the big thing is here is that we take advantage of the default state of whatever system you give it. So, for instance, if you're walking in for standard Windows research or Linux or Mac research, and you want to say from a base level system, this is what should exist, then yes, absolutely. It just plugs into the existing APIs. Nothing additional has to be installed. It just runs and shows you the data. However, if you're trying to use this for a specific case, and you actually have a copy of a VMDK or a disk or a cloud image, and you boot that up, then you'll be able to show in that actually recreated environment how those things would have been detected so you can recreate those things exactly as they existed. So either way, yeah. I mean, yeah. So like for, I think there's two different mindsets here. One is the practitioner doing an investigation. The other is just for research from the practitioner level. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's not always enabled. Um, the better time it's going to be enabled for your investigations, which is nice. Um, and it's probably one of my go-to historical artifacts. It's going to show you file system activity and you'll get depending on how noisy the system is, depends on how far it goes back. But again, that's when you go back to your volume shadows, your carving if you have to, and you can recover a lot of good USN data. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there were a couple of API questions, which I'm gonna actually paste into your hallway channel here, um, because I think that'll be a, a easier place for that to go. Um, but I think the last one, if you might be able to kind of kind of sum this up, I think it'll be a really good bookend to uh, to the material. Do you have a couple of specific use cases from your own investigations where these these tools, or even just these artifacts, which then led to the value of the tools, uh, became particularly helpful? 
Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you go Do first, you mind man. if I start that and then pass yeah. it off to you? Yep. So this is a really cool one because it actually ties back to uh, what Lee Whitfield was talking about earlier of, you know, the validation aspect of things and like, you know, you've got to be really careful when you do investigations. Um, and one is we had a case a while back and we saw a lot of office files being deleted from the USN journal. So, but they weren't actually user, I can't exactly remember all of the details of it, but we, it led us to go down the research path of, hey, uh, it looks like there was office documents that get deleted but then get recreated with the same MFT mm -hmm. number. And if you're not careful and you don't do the research on that, you're going to assume that these files were deleted. So I'll turn it over to Dave on where we went. And so we were able to do that and when we took a deeper look, we realized the sequence numbers were updating. It's just the entry number was being reused and that's because of the nature of Office documents that when you save them and actually delete them and recreate them. And we are able to then put that into the pieces to be able to show not only each time it was saved, but how many times the documents were interacted with, which was great because we only had an external drive and we wanted to be able to show what was happening through these documents, how often they were being used. Um, we've used it there. Uh, the generation of Triforce happened because of a huge litigation uh, between two giant companies and the existence of one BKF file that was deleted and trying to understand how it got created, where it got existed. Uh, the, a lot of the, the Mac stuff that we generated and the original you know, Mac research and plugging into Apps Events all stemmed off of uh, the, the Oculus lawsuit. Um, against, uh, from ZeniMax, you know, $10 billion they were asking for, and we were able to prove exactly what happened there. Um, I mean, there's so many cases where we have been able to take this level of detail for the issues that matter, right? You don't do it for everything. And I, I think that's the biggest thing to understand is that we, I don't stop and say, okay, before we make any conclusion on a case, we're going to take everything apart. No, it's for the things that really matter and the things that have those multi-million dollar effects. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Well, hey, thank you guys very much. It's always uh, entertaining and, uh, and educational, and I appreciate the time, and, and especially I appreciate the uh, uh, releasing the tools to the public so everybody can start to take advantage of these and up the game overall for, uh, for, for the community. So thanks very much. No problem. And KPMG is hiring, and it's a great place to work.